and welcome to Speaking of Schools. This is our session on distance learning, do's and don'ts. Because of all of the um, challenges of COVID-19, this is one of the, the newest challenges to our public schools and it's the big one. My name is Nadine Greinig and I am the Tribal Outreach Coordinator for Save Our Schools Arizona. I'm also the former Director of Indian Education for the State Department of Education and I'm also the, currently the CEO for the Southwestern Institute for the Education of Native Americans. So I've been working with the Native population for going on 20 years now. So that's who I am and I would like to introduce our panelists. But before I do that, uh, I made a mistake when I sent out the link. Um, there was a little miscommunication on my part. So you who are joining us, I would like for you to mute uh, and we're going to take questions through the chat line instead, the chat box. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them uh, there, but uh, remain on mute so that we can have um, our presenters speak and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm going to introduce them by way of reading their bios. Don't have them memorized, so I'm gonna be reading here. And uh, so the, our first presenter is Donna Manuelito. She's the Assistant Superintendent of Academic Excellence at San Carlos Unified School District on the San Carlos Apache Reservation. She's waving. And she has her master's degree in educational leadership with a minor in special education from the University of Northern Colorado. She also has a master's degree in bilingual multicultural education from Northern Arizona University. Donna is Navajo and Irish. She grew up on the Navajo Reservation and has over 30 years of experience in rural education. Although most of her experience has been on the Navajo Nation, Donna spent a few years at a mostly Hispanic ranching community in Galena, New Mexico, before she came to the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Our next speaker is Cheryl Houses. She has been the Parent Educator Coordinator at San Carlos Unified School District since August of 2018. Her job is to create opportunities for parents to learn how to create a firm family foundation that provides the support and structure for their students through online classes and presentations. Cheryl earned her Bachelor of Science degree in English secondary education from Northern Arizona University in 1992. And our third panelist is Jessica Gambrell. She's a second grade lead teacher at Indian Oasis Primary School in the Baba Kivri Unified School District on the Tana Autumn Nation. She has been teaching in the district for four years. Jessica earned her bachelor's degree in elementary education with an emphasis in special needs from Grand Canyon University. She also has an associate degree in early childhood education from Brown Mackey College. Jessica was born and raised in Colorado. She moved to Arizona in 2004 because her mother wanted to work in the Native American community and was offered the opportunity to work on the Tonawatham Nation. Jessica was able to attend numerous events on the nation and was able to participate in activities with the children. Since 2008, Jessica has been working with children from, uh, from birth through elementary school, which helped her develop her teaching skills. So welcome everybody. It's good to have you. So um, why don't we go ahead, we'll go in reverse order and I'll have Jessica just say a little something about herself to say hello. Um, so I just wanted to say um, I am very thankful for being here. Um, a lot of people have pushed me to do this and I really appreciate it. Um, and then I'm excited to help you guys know the do's and don'ts from my experiences. Um, I don't have everything planned out and perfect. We're all learning, but we all can share our information with one another and hopefully we all become successful. Thanks, Jessica. So, Cheryl? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cheryl Houses. I am a, a resident here of the San Carlos Apache Reservation. Um, I went to school here at the school that we're actually working at right now. I went from kindergarten through eighth grade. So I'm very familiar with the school district that we work in. And I did go back to school um, when I graduated from high school to, um, to come back and teach, help our people. And I stayed here for a little while and then I moved to Colorado 
for 21 years where my husband got a job. And so I was gone for 21 years and came back to the reservation and came back to where I started my career, back at the St. Carlos Apache, St. Carlos Unified School District. And I started as a um, communications officer. And once that job was um, put aside, Dr. Dennis and I created a new position, the parent educator program, which she pulled me into. And I, it was a great opportunity for me to meet with parents and build a foundation for our, our parents because we all know that a healthy home foundation is where our kids are most successful. So we can get our parents involved. That's where we're trying, that's what we're trying to do here. So we've been in training with tons of programs. We work a lot with the um, fatherhood, fatherhood is sacred, um, father and families. Um, uh, fatherhood and families is association yes yes um with, with <laughs> Mr. Pooley. yes yes yeah that <laughs> well, i can't think of it it's like a brain fart right now you know <laughs> what am okay. I thinking? so so we work we have a lot of those classes under our belt we're trained facilitators for fatherhood is sacred motherhood is sacred um linking generations through strengthening relationships and the domestic violence so we've taken these classes so that we can provide support for our parents. In addition to that, our, our main class that we teach here is Apache Parenting. Um, and it's a Apache Parenting curriculum that was designed and created by the San Carlos um, Tribal Tribe, along with the um, First Things First program. And they developed this program that we're teaching. And, it's, it's basically a foundation for our parents that shows how pre-reservation life and how we can incorporate a lot of those ideals that we had before we became on the reservation into home life today. And a lot of it has to do with our culture, has a lot to do with um, involving our language. Um, we have a lot of our history in there. So it's a really great program that we have every Wednesday night, which is going on right now simultaneously during this this um, meeting here. So it's a great program. Well, we're very grateful that you've taken out the time this evening to join us. And we wanna tap into your wisdom and your experience. So, thank you. Thank Donna, you. would you like to say hello? Good evening, everyone. My name is Donna Manuelito. I'm Tabanha do Bilagana Bashishchin, Shichei Yo'idene, and Shanali is Irish. I have been here at San Carlos for four years and um, just recently with this um, pandemic had to learn how to do all this. So we were able to get um, a Schoology learning management system and we were able to train our teachers during fourth quarter and then we had summer sessions as well. We had two summer sessions that were able to help teachers again. And then in July, we were fortunate enough to get two high school Schoology gurus to do recordings and post them and really just to learn how to make um, it more interactive for our students. That's wonderful. So you, you've got uh, a summer session and a semester under your belt? So far? A quarter, fourth quarter. And then we got two summer sessions, which was in June and one in July. And then we had um, the July trainings with the with the two gurus. So we we were actually very fortunate to um, our district to support us in getting us our apps and stuff that went into the Schoology um, learning management system. Okay, so I would like to know um, prior to COVID nineteen, of course, you you taught on uh, on campus or in in the building. Um, did any of you have any experience prior to COVID-19 doing distance learning? I see two shaking. I, no, I, no, I, no, I wouldn't say like distance learning, but I would say um, when I was in New Mexico, they did have combination classes because it was so rural that we were able to do um, Schoology. That's where I learned about Schoology was in, in Guyana. Um, they would teach their kindergartners and then have their first grade on Schoology. And then they would, when they had their first grade groups, the kindergartners would go on Schoology. So it was just a way to differentiate instruction 
-hmm. without having to teach kindergarten, first grade listening in on kindergarten, kindergarten listening on first grade. So it was really a way to um, differentiate their teaching and keep this, the grades apart. Mm -hmm. And it gave the, the students some experience too uh, online. Yeah, and, 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 and also doing also doing coursework for my master. Some of it was done online. Some of the classes were were um, that I participated was online. Okay, so uh, let me ask Jessica, what has been different about educating online versus in person? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> um, so there's a big difference. It's huge. Um, I feel like online teaching is, it helps the visual learners, um, but at the same time, you know, those kids that need to get up to get the pencil, then to come back to the desk, that, that is, um, that has an effect on them. Um, the one big thing is having the right connection, and when they don't have the right connection, they're missing the the time that they get to spend with me on um, my Google Meets and then the time that I get to teach them. Uh, so I just think um, when you are doing online, you need to have good communication with your families because um, say like your internet stopped working, you need to let your teacher know so that they are able to record the information and you're able to watch it at a different time. Um, in our district, we still have students doing paper packets um, just due to uh, them not being able to afford internet. Um, some of the communities don't have good hotspots or Wi-Fi connection. Um, so having kids on paper packets is very, very hard because um, you have to call the families at least twice a week to make sure that they're understanding what they're uh, doing on the paper packet um, and then also having that, and um, also providing that, the families need to provide the space for a quiet environment. And sometimes that's very hard and not manageable for them, which I understand just knowing how families work and knowing that a whole bunch of people are in the house and you know, we have to work with what we have and the bet and do the best we can and it's hard. So, yeah, I can, I can only imagine. I, I have no experience with that, but I can only imagine when for, in our family, we had six kids. So, yeah. and we were always busy and running around and doing things and making noise. And, <laughs> but my mother led with an iron fist and she was a stay at home mom. So she could probably uh, have disciplined enough, us enough to, to do that. But not every mom is able to be at home. Or, yeah, and there are there are kids who have multiple siblings in different areas. And right. so sometimes it happens to be I'm on a meeting with my student in second grade and then the kindergarten is also having meetings or vice versa and they can hear me, I can hear them. Mm -hmm. It's it's really, really parent communication is the number one I'm gonna lead with is parent communication. All right, thank you. So, so that brings me to Cheryl and so you're the parent educator coordinator. Um, would you like to add to what Cheryl is, is saying or how do you deal with with the situations that she's mentioned? Well, you know, we have a lot of um, similar problems here with our parent base. Um, I think the only thing that we have an advantage for is that now we get parent participation with our kids who are at home. You know, they're now on Schoology. Schoology, they're they're helping their kids get online. They're watching their kids at school. So now we actually have an opportunity to connect with some of these parents that we have that are online. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying our best to make sure that we're able to contact and keep in contact with these parents because our job as parent educators in this new system is we wanna keep them engaged. We wanna keep them involved. We wanna be able to teach them things they haven't learned um, since their kids have been in school, which is to learn how they um, ha have their kids, they can check their kids' grades, they can check their attendance, they can check their homework. And these are things that weren't, they were available, but they were never taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. So we, we have the opportunity to be in their homes, to be able to help whenever, however we can. And then we also offer our classes as well 
as tools to help them with their parenting at home. That's great. That was going to be one of my questions too is, you know, what do you do about parents? What kind of training or support do parents need? And I think you answered, answered that um, at least to an extent. So how about your teachers, uh, Donna? Are they well prepared for distance teaching? And if you know, you're on mute, um, and, and if they aren't, what kind of training or support are they getting? I think they're as well prepared as they can be. Um, we did give them training. We do have, um, like I said, our two gurus. We have, with that training that we did in July, it was 30 minutes. They recorded it. It was posted. But it really brought our schools together. It was no more Rice Elementary, middle school, high school. It was like we were really a unified school district. We were having elementary teachers helping middle school teachers or middle school teachers helping elementary teachers. You know, we, we just really opened up that um, floodgate for us to become a unified school district. The other thing I want to mention is um, our superintendent at San Carlos Unified School District, Dr. Dennison, um, has been working with the, the chairman. So even if the kids don't have electricity, we just provide him with a copy of their electric bill and, and he works on getting them electricity. Our business office has ordered Hubble with our IT department. So now if students don't have internet, we provide internet. The tribal internet um, company here, Skatui, they were really instrumental in getting a lot of our kids internet as well. So just with this tribe being a, a smaller tribe, we were able to work closely with the tribal leaders. That's wonderful. So it's not all necessarily negative or gloom and doom or, or only and, issues and challenges. And, and we also um, open up our middle school for kids that need to charge their, um, their, uh, their device. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't have anyone at home to help them, we provide PPEs, we provide them a place, we have um, Wi-Fi available, so we really provide a lot from, I think it was 9 to 2.30, kids can come in and get help. That's great, and speaking of needing to charge your device, <laughs> I'm on battery apparently, I thought I was plugged in, so if you'll excuse me just a second, let me plug in my computer before I lose you. Okay, I'm back. I don't know how that happened, but I'm good again. Okay, <laughs> so let me see, back to my questions. So um, that's wonderful that you've been able to do that. And so on the flip side of that, Jessica, as a teacher, what has really helped you to be able to, to take on this new challenge? Um, so personally, in my years past, I have, we use a uh, Google, we use Google Classroom, Google Meets, all of that for our kids to um, have that learning um, experience. I have used it in the past with my second graders. So um, for fourth quarter, it was pretty easy for my kids to remember how to log on, but starting the new year with them, it was a little bit more challenging because they're, they were first graders and coming in and, um, you know, we've actually, I have a lot of kids joining every day. They're coming in, they're doing their work. So I do um, see that as well as a positive. Um, you know, I YouTubed a lot of stuff. If some people were asking me how to do something, I YouTubed it. And then, you know, I um, just messed around with um, the different things that Google does have to offer and, you know, reaching out to teachers who have done it before, like mm -hmm. on Facebook, on, on um, different social media sites, that has helped me a lot. And I'm able to take that to my team and then take it to other people who are else also in need of that. Um, and I think just knowing that we can't do everything in one day. Like we cannot make all the standards be the kids knowing, like we have to take it based on the kids. And so just turning my teacher brain off and saying, okay, you know, gotta slow down. One, we have to learn the technology. We have to learn 
you know, typing skills, like that is super hard for kids. Like you wouldn't think about it. Okay, let's just put them on a computer. They'll be able to do it. Sometimes they, they can and sometimes they can't. And mm -hmm. um, just reminding other teachers, like fellow teachers, like, hey, we got to slow down. We got to be flexible. This is the most, the, the best time to be flexible and show that you are able to adapt to what you are being faced with. Um, I know that I have a lot of um, families who have grandparents and I spent that first two weeks just, hey, do you need help getting on? Do you need help navigating through Google Classroom? I used a fellow teacher to sh help me um, show them a student site since I'm a teacher. It was, um, it's a lot. So, so it's not just training for teachers or administrators or, or school no. staff. You're it's doing training for families Yes. Parents, students mm -hmm. who may have never had access to a computer. So that's why they don't have those keying skills. Probably never had a typing class or anything like that either. So, wow. I, I just have to stop for a moment and commend you all for what you're doing. I've never been a teacher in the classroom. I, I don't know how you do it. And you're sticking in there. I know a lot of people have left the profession and it's, it's understandable. Um, for the various reasons that they've given, but you guys are hanging in there and I'm so proud of you and so happy to have you working with our native students because they're already missing so much and, and neglected in a lot of ways. So, so thank you and I appreciate the opportunity to work through Save Our Schools Arizona to present things like this, uh, you know, to do sessions like this and, and talk about challenges. That, and it's just so encouraging that you are finding that you're working together and you're supporting each other and coming together in ways that you, you may not have before. And as Cheryl, you mentioned, um, the parents are kind of having to take advantage of the things that they never did before. And parent engagement has always been a big challenge, um, especially among Native Americans, but across the board. Uh, parents are busy or they say that's the school's job to educate my children. I don't need to be there. I have my job. They have theirs. But you know, as, as data shows, um, the more involved a parent is in their children's education in a productive way, in a collaborative way, uh, the better the child does. So that's, that's really great that, and I imagine now that they've had a taste of it, that that will carry forward to after COVID, after um, we get past this and children can come back into the actual classroom for, for you to work with them. So um, do you have different approaches because you do work on, on reservations and I'm sure you may have um, some students who are not Native American, maybe not Apache, not TO, not um, Autumn, I should say. I have more respect for that. Um, so do you have a difference in how you work now that you're doing it online uh, in working with Native students versus non-Native students? Anybody can answer that one. I would say we, we are 99.10% native. And so what we've done is we've done success coaches. Every student in our district has a success coach. So okay. like we kind of changed their role. So like if they were a PE teacher and we're not doing PE, then they get 25 students. They contact them, they, they look at their grades, they look at their attendance and, and, and they, um, okay, your device isn't working, you need a charger, okay, let's get that to you. And so every school has a success coach coordinator. So I think that's what has really changed was just hitting the social emotional needs of our students. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's wonderful, thank you. Anybody else wanna share? Um, for me personally, um, I, want to say thank you to my mom because she took me out to a lot of uh, um a, a lot of the events that are happening out there when before covid and you know i had um had i not had i have respect for the culture so just coming out and being any kind of teacher just just knowing that you have to respect everybody's culture um is very important um our district has a culture teacher so they're able to have virtual meetings with the culture teacher uh, once a week. 
and um, you hear kids singing the songs um, throughout the meetings of my my day. I'm like, I'm just trying to teach, but I love <laughs> the music. So um, that is how I take it. Uh, I did have to, re I do have to respect and make sure I'm not coming off as rude or anything of those means. Um, me personally is what I would like to say. Yes, sir. Some time ago, uh, when I was at the department, I did some focus groups with educators trying to determine the best practices for educating Native American students. And that was one of the highest, the things that came up highest on the list was, was having respect for the culture, learning the culture, uh, spending time in the community, letting uh, your face be known and seen, uh, interacting with pe people from the community, not just, and of course, mainly this is for non-Native educators. Um, and, uh, you know, letting people see that you really care about the kids and where they come from and not as making assumptions, um, showing them love, showing them that they're welcome when they come to school, you're happy to see them, giving them time to, to listen to them, et cetera. So do you find that a little more challenging, uh, having personal relationships with your students because you're, you're, all you're trying to do is get them educated now online and even getting them, um, you know, to be, especially for you, Jessica, you've got second graders or little ones and their attention span probably is already challenged. So how, has that worked to, um, are you able to continue to have some kind of personal relationships with your students? I, yes. Um, so usually I have, I have my uh, day split up where I meet with half of my kids in the morning and half of my kids in the afternoon. Um, they get to pick when they want to um, join. And then within that, I have an hour and a half time with them of virtual face-to-face. -face. And I spend that, you know, 10 minutes of just talking, how was your night? What did you do? What did you eat? You know, just having those conversations. And, you know, that brings up a lot of um, things that they want to tell me. So they're, they're just, Gabby, 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 I want to tell you everything. Um, so then after that, like 10 minutes, I know they know, okay, I'm ready to get work. We spend like 30 minutes, 20 minutes to an, uh, a learning topic. And then we do a dance break, a water break, a bathroom break. And then they come back and then we do the same thing. And then we do a dance break, a water break. And we'll spend that whole time in, uh, for them just to see me, talk to me. You know, when we're breaks, they're like, Miss Gabriella, I can't see you. I can't see you. I can't see you. And so like, they're just excited to see me and talk to somebody who isn't in their house. They're like, "Ooh, what do you have? What's this? What's this? And I was like, okay, we'll have, a, we'll have a 20 minute talk sesh and we'll just talk about everything you want to talk about. And I think that's what helps me get my kids engaged is because I'm taking that time and to talk to them and to learn about their daily life is how I keep my day going because, you know, they just tell me one thing, I start laughing and my day's better, you know, uh, yeah. the kids really do affect everything. Well, you affect their mood and they affect yours. So mm -hmm. kind of a two-way thing. That's why it's so important. So uh, Cheryl, um, are you having this, a similar experience with the parents that you said they're they obviously have to be more engaged because they have to help their children you know, get online and et cetera. So how has that experience been? Well, it's been really interesting. Um, we have quite a few of our parents who work for the school district. So we have, you know, custodians, teacher aides, um, groundskeepers. We have a lot of our parents who work within the school district. And then we also have parents who are teachers. Um, we have um, Apache teachers in the classrooms. So Great. We, have found, um, we have found that Quite a few of our, our parents who are working within the school district are very supportive of their children. You know, they're, they attend a lot of our parenting classes um, because they're offered and they find them interesting and they find things in there that they can use at home. So we also have parents that are out in the district that, um, we, we, we have found that a lot of our parents who have a very low educational level um, are afraid of this. They're afraid of the technology. They're afraid of wanting to get involved because 
we're dealing with a lot of our parents who have a third grade education, a fifth grade education. So for us to actually bring this to them and show them this is how they do these things, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult. It's pretty hard. And, but we're going to continue doing this because this is, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way everyone's going to be learning from now on. And for us to be able to provide these opportunities for them, to bring them tools and ways to help our parents understand what this means, it, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge, but we're, we're out there, like, like um, Donna had mentioned, we're all success coaches, all of us, even the parent educators. We are success coaches. We have our list of kids and families that we take care of. So our jobs and our roles are to make sure that our kids and our parents are taken care of. We talk to them just like we're their friends. We're, well, we want to be their friends. We want to be their support. So we step in there and we're talking to them and telling them, what do you need from us? What can we help, we help you with? How can we access this? We're, we're constantly asking questions on a weekly basis so that we can get them involved in the school. So we really, we have a big role. We have a big role to fill here. And it's, it's a little tough, but you know what? Life is tough. <laughs> We've got to get through it, you know? And, and we're going to get through this. And I'm really confident that this is going to be the way of the future for us here. So do you do your parenting classes online as well? Yes, all of our classes are online. Okay. And the parenting class that we have right now that's going on, we usually have between 15 and 30 parents that attend. And that includes um, staff um, and includes other people, other organizations that are a part of our classes. And it's, it's a really great class for them to be in because they're learning the Apache culture, they're learning the Apache history, they're learning how the teachers that are taking this class, these classes are learning how to incorporate some of the things that we're teaching them into lesson plans and, and being able to share with their kids. So this carries in through the home, it carries in through the classroom. So a lot of the things that we are sharing online are these classes for our parents. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, as you said, it's gonna go on for a long time. So I'm really glad that you have parents who are willing to learn how to do all of this and they can share with others and share their excitement as they learn. And I'm sure they feel a lot more invested as well and, and able to help their children. It's gotta give them a really good feeling. But Donna, what if anything is different? I would imagine there are a lot of things that are different about being an administrator um, during COVID and, and you know, how do you, how do you administer how do you do your job that's different now? Um, what's the, what are the biggest challenges um, that you have? I think one of the biggest challenges we had when we did our Arizona online instruction application, the, one of the questions was, is our email secure? And what we found out was we have the, the Gmail accounts that come with the Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. We had to put it internal and then we had to give the teachers new email accounts through the sancarlos.k12.az.us domain because our emails were not secure. So our students could get outside email, they could send outside email. So now we, we found that that's the crucial point is making sure our email is secure for our students. The other thing was um, incorporating that LMS um, Schoology as one login. So we, we had to buy the Zoom application, we bought um, book widgets, anything that was interactive with Schoology. So the students just had to sign into Schoology and all their work was in there. So they didn't have to go out and go to uh, Mayon. They didn't have to go out to Study Island. Mm -hmm. Everything was in there. So that was a, something that we wanted to make sure students had just to log into that one place and everything was available to them. That's wonderful. Very good thinking. <laughs> Makes it a little bit easier. So um, what would any of you say is the worst thing or maybe the least productive thing or the biggest mistake you think a, a teacher can make um, working I just with wanted to, online. Oh, I sure. wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. um, 
to what Donna was saying, the Schoology thing, we, we're also part of that, the parent educator program. So we have our own um, file. So, and all of our files are recorded. And so anytime you have missed one of our classes that we presented online, you can mm -hmm. go into our file, go to that class, click on it and watch it. And it's been recorded and anyone, any of the teachers, any of the students, anyone is able to get into, any of the parents, are able to get into our file and watch any of our our classes that we've already had that's terrific so yeah people are kind of what, what's that that phrase the necessity is the mother of invention well apparently <laughs> COVID is the, the way to get people into technology <laughs> and to learn all the different ways that that things can be I know we probably each have software like say Excel for example and you know you know how to enter stuff you know how to do a sum you know you may not know how to sort but you don't necessarily know how to do a pivot table or you know all the things that that can be done with that technology because you're busy doing other things but sometimes you're forced into learning learning how to do something because it's going to help your job or your boss ask for it you know or whatever it might be so yeah i think this could lead to all of us being very proficient with, with multiple technology systems. So um, Donna, have you received any grants or any kind of financial support for, for converting, so to speak, or transitioning to online education? I would just say the CARE Act. Mm -hmm. The CARES Act was, was one of the things that we were able to do and we were using some of our impact aid to, to cover some of this. Um, also, um, we already had purchased PD, online PD for our staff okay. so that they could count it towards some, some incentives. So they have um, access to Simple K-12, which is all, all about technology. That was um, three years ago that we got that for them. So they were able to, to do some of the um, interactive, how to make your Zoom more interactive, how to use your zoom as a whiteboard so they were able to do do that we also had a subscription to ascd and then our new hr person got us um who knew it so all of these new things teachers can do while they're um trying to learn something we also have um what we had done was we had met as an administrative group and we decided that we were only going to do um so for K-5, they only meet 45 minutes a day, and the rest is asynchronous. And then um, our 6th through 8th grade, they meet 75 minutes a day. And then our ninth through 12th grade, they meet 90 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And for middle school and high school, their Monday is their first period, their Tuesday is their second period. They're going to make up the four and a half hours doing the Schoology work, submitting their work, doing that. So, so it really becomes where the teacher is, is really doing the lesson for that day, and then they do the work for the week during um, Schoology. We also have um, times for office hours, so our students can, you know, check in. They've got a Zoom open for like two hours, and students can go in there and, you know, say, I need help with this or I need to, um, you know, something's going on. I need, you know, I need to talk to somebody. And then they also have times for their PLCs and their grade level meetings. So it just becomes more, it, it just became more of a Zoom interaction. Mm -hmm. How do you do, they, they do breakout sessions. Um, I know the elementary three through five has um, a small group during the day so that the kids that they think need help, they'll they'll let the parents know, can you put them on at this time? So it, it's really becoming more how, how to be more interactive with your students during this time. Okay. Wow, you, you guys are really doing, I picked the right people, I think, to, <laughs> to be on this panel. Uh, I'm, again, I'm really appreciating this. I hope uh, our audience, just a reminder, if you have any questions, um, probably in about five minutes, we'll break for questions. Uh, make sure you put them into the chat box. You can just type them in there and uh, we'll answer them. The panel will answer them the best that they can. Um, but until then, 
I was asking earlier, what do you think the biggest mistake an, an educator or a parent um, educator coordinator or administrator uh, can make? Um, I'll go to the educator first. Or, well, you're all educators, but to Jessica first, because I've heard on the news, you know, that uh, some of the challenges that educators have, like you've alluded to before, is not real familiar with technology. Um, they're trying to do something while they're teaching and they, they go off somewhere they didn't intend to go off because they hit the wrong button or they got off the lesson or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, that's disruptive, obviously, to, to teaching. And I would imagine they lose some of the attention of the, of the students as well while they're doing that. So the other thing is I've heard them say, well, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. And they're flustered. And again, that's not real conducive to, to teaching or learning. So maybe in your experience, or maybe there's teachers who've come to you because you have shown that you, you know, you're able to, to teach uh, educators how to do some of this through trial and error, I'm sure. So what would you think would be the, the don't, you know? And Cheryl and Donna think about this too. So we've talked a lot about what, you know, the do's are, but what would you say the big don'ts are? Um, so I think you really, like if a student is having trouble, like turning in an assignment on, on our end on Google, like you're able to see them working on the assignment because it automatically saves and say you notice that they didn't turn it in, don't get nitpicky on like, oh, they're not turning it in, but you can see their work. And just realizing that this is their first time typing on a computer, you're asking them to write um, the numbers in a box, or you're asking them to write complete sentences. Like, yes, it's all really fun, fundamental or the foundational skills that they need, but technology, um, is going to help them be successful but at the same time just knowing that they're still kids they still make mistakes and just knowing that if you call them and say hey what did you mean by this or um do you need help turning it in just i think the best thing is is to be flexible and if you cannot turn your brain to be flexible and understand that the kids are still learning then i don't think you should be teaching, honestly, because our kids, just like yourself, if you're getting frustrated with the computer, they're getting frustrated with the computer, and they probably may not have somebody at home to help them, or, you know, maybe it's grandma who's helping them, and grandma doesn't understand technology, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, or it's brother and sister who are in high school, and they have their classes to worry about, and, you know, just being... I, there's, I don't want to put negative on it, but you need to understand that kids are still learning and to be flexible is don't, don't over, don't expect them to know everything day one coming out the gate. Don't expect them to know it month after coming out the day, gate because, you know, the, when you're in a classroom, you know, the first month is like, okay, this is our procedure, this is our procedure, this is our procedure, this, 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 and you're just going through it with them. But virtually, you have to do it for more than just a month. You may have to do it the whole time you're doing virtual. They may forget it, and it's okay. It is okay to reteach something, and it's okay to be flexible and not so teach. Patience is the big word I would take yes. away from that. Be yeah. very patient, be very understanding. Think about how you're feeling. They're feeling that probably 10 times more. Yes. Because you're, you're the one in authority and they're not. All right, great, thank you. Uh, you got some, some support through our chat box. People agree with you not to nitpick and families are going through a lot and uh, great comments. So your, your feedback is appreciated. So Cheryl or Donna, do you wanna share anything? Um, I'll go next. I just wanted to mention um, that. One thing that we we have really been um, one of the things that we really have been somebody needs to mute excuse me somebody needs to mute their computer is that it's cheryl's other class it's my oh, other is class that's going on i'm sorry let <laughs> cheryl, me mute that yourself. <laughs> i know let me mute let me mute that uh, 
pulls on, sorry. Okay, so um, one of the things that we, we've come across with our parents is that we have a lot of parents who don't like school, don't like anything that has to do with school, don't want to be involved with the school. They're, they're here because a lot of them have to get their, their um, it's called TANF, they got to get the signatures that say that their kids are in school. So in order for them to receive funding, that they have to get their kids in school. But you can't force a parent to not to do something they don't want to do. You're not going, you're not going to be able to get help that way. Um, we have parents that, that have dropped out, like I said, in the third grade. And they're not going to want to learn new technology. They're not going to want to be checking on their kids' grades. They're just going to be there. So those are the parents that we, those are the ones we, we need. We need to have those parents involved because that carries down and trickles down into the kids. And so we need to be able to provide uh, a safe place for them to let them know that we're here. We're here to help them. I, we know you guys don't want to be here, but we're here to help you. And we're going to do whatever we can to provide that assistance for you and your children. And anything that you need, if you need to learn how to use the computers, learn how to log in, learn how to turn it on and off. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're here to provide the most support that we can for our parents. And we have, and like, like you heard from Jessica, we have a lot of older kids who have a lot of younger kids in the school. So we're very fortunate that we have family kids who are in high school, who are helping their middle school um, brothers and sisters and elementary. So you can see a whole table with four kids with all of their computers on it. And you can see that visual that this is what's going on in the homes. You can see them all working from home and you can see the parents standing off to the side taking pictures of what's <laughs> happening, but they don't want to be involved with <laughs> They're, they're just happy that something is happening, you know? So mm -hmm. we're just there to provide the support that we can for our parents. That's great. I just got chills because I pictured, I can picture that and it's so exciting to me to, to know that that's happening. So the takeaway is don't force parents, you know, that don't want to do what they don't want to do, but always make sure that they feel welcome. And if they do want assistance that you're there, you know, for them to provide that. That's terrific. So um, before you, you, you respond, Donna, I just wanted to let Jessica know that she has a job offer to be someone's te child's teacher. <laughs> so so uh, maybe we can connect you two later. <laughs> but anyway, she was very happy to hear what you had to say. So go ahead, Donna. For, for an administrator, um, I think what we need to do is let the um, teachers know that you're not going to cover all the standards that we developed over the summer, what, what we call our safety net standards. When we have our admin meetings, one thing that, that the principals were really concerned about was the social and emotional needs of their students. So one thing we did is this first two weeks of school, all we did was um, social emotional um, interactions, community builders is what we call them. So over the summer, um, we work with Chris Hagedorn, and um, he's from the culture piece, and he's out in Minnesota, I think. But he he works with our staff that we call change agents. So during the summer, um, we still wanted to keep that piece going. So he conducted um, with our federal project director um, training with our change agents um, how how to do this virtually. So they were bringing people in and, you know, like how to do the Jeopardy or the bingo or just to make it interactive and get the kids involved. So we had orientation the first week before school started. And one of those days was specifically spent for the social emotional need. So our change agents were teaching our teachers um, reflection, mindfulness, stuff like that. So um, PBIS expectations. So this week is, that's what we're doing this week and last week was just getting the kids to interact with each other, breaking out into small groups. So just having that piece. The other thing um, that, that was uh, a miss last year at the uh, fourth quarter was we were having teachers select their own times. And so 
It was just a mess. So this year, um, our Rice Elementary meets from 9 to 10.45, our middle school from 10.30 to 11.45, and our high school meets from 1 to 2.30. So that way, our, we as administrators can jump in those, into those classrooms and still do walkthroughs and still see the interaction. So we have access to all their classes. So we're, um, I think that was one thing that was a miss last year at fourth quarter was we just said, do your classes. But this year there's more guidance to it. We also have this week, um, the high school's having their brave week and our middle school's having their um, virtual spirit week. So things are still going as normal, but doing it virtually where our student council, they're doing their elections, I think, um, the first week of September. So there, there's things still going on, but it was just um, putting it in a time frame. Great. That sounds great. So for me, the take the don't take away from that is don't let your teachers just run amok. <laughs> don't don't let them go without guidance. Don't let them go without support. Um, and and we that. we were actually um, a one to one device and before this and we were at Google's um, classroom. So the kids already knew how to do a lot of this. It, it wasn't really anything new to them. So it, it was a really, um, it was one thing that this district that I had been in that I haven't seen in other districts was the technology piece that um, every, every teacher had a whiteboard or a smart board in their classrooms. Every teacher yeah. had a docu cam. So when, when we had the shutdown, they were able to come on to get their their equipment so that they could continue teaching with what they needed. Yeah, I can imagine what a challenge it has been for those school districts that don't have the kind of systems that you already had in place, online systems, uh, ways of teaching and educating and working with your parents and teachers. So since you didn't have to start from the beginning, but you know, with that kind of technology, do you have any advice for people who are still struggling with that? I would imagine you go to your IT person maybe first. Yeah, uh, we, we have what we call um, an admin team and it has like our buildings and grounds, our superintendent, our um, myself, the business manager, the CFO, the HR director and the IT and our principals. And so at that level, that's where we get the information because the principals will bring what the teachers discuss or what the teachers needs are and then um, we talk to IT how, how can we go about this so it's really um, we we have um, a real good communication between between the admin team and the core team that's great yeah so communication is another one of those must must haves um, you can't collaborate well or you know have positive out outcomes if you don't communicate the needs and and then you know work together to meet those needs and and we also um about four years ago we we had started a um strategic reform plan so we were working through that so we were actually ahead of the game because we had every year we we put in our what are we going to do this year what needs to be implemented. And then we go back to our strategic plan to look at where, what we've done and then how far we need to go this, this year. That's great. Always need a plan and not just have a plan, but actually implement it. <laughs> and, yeah, then and, it and it was ongoing. I mean, it, it we just will say um, completed or, you know, ongoing or, who needs to do this so that everybody knows what their job is and, and what, what the timeline is to complete it. Yeah, and, and every uh, public school district in Arizona is required if they're receiving Title I funds or other federal funding, they're required to submit a plan, a strategic plan to the Arizona Department of Education. And of course, that has your goals and strategies and action steps, who's responsible. So that's great. Like I said, you need to follow your plan and you need to hold people accountable and then you need to evaluate whether your plan is working or not and make um, adjustments accordingly. So um, do we have any questions? We have about five minutes left. Uh, have great comments, but haven't had any questions. So now is your chance uh, to ask your questions. Until we get some, I'll, I'll ask some more on my own. So, 
Um, I know that educators often, if not always, have to invest some of their own money into supplies and materials and uh, you know whatever it might be because they don't get enough funding. And that, you know, that's what Save Our Schools is about, is actually trying to preserve the public school um, funds, taxpayer dollars that go into our public schools, trying to keep uh, as little as possible of them going out to um, private schools uh, through vouchers. So, you know, that's what we try to do. But we, rec and obviously, if you're already having to put in some of your own money, when that happens, that that increases um, the need for uh, educators to support their own classrooms. So has any of that changed now that you're online instead of in person? I think for our teachers, what, they, what they've had to do is upgrade their internet. Okay. Because they're holding Zoom classes, they're, they're having to upload to their um, courses. So I think our district has been really um, good about providing like Cami and um, book widgets, all these apps that they can, they can um, make their PDFs or their, their um, anything that they have that the teacher, that the students need to fill out. Mm -hmm. It makes it more, um, e it makes it easier for the, the staff to transform it to a fillable document. Yes, exactly. That's great. Um, so we have, let's see, I have a question. Uh, how are you assisting IEP students through remote learning? So we have um, a special ed director, an ESS director, I should say, and um, they have, they, they have went through their IEPs. And so we have, at the high school, we have two special ed teachers there. At the middle school, we have one. We have a, a place called Braveway which is for our students that, that kind of need extra help. And it's not because of an IEP, but maybe behaviors. So working with them to, to learn how to behave in school and how to behave in class, how not to hit and stuff like that. So for us, they work with the teacher. And, and then if they have a, a, a hard time, then, then that special ed teacher will join that class and work with that student. And do you have enough? to go around? We have um, instructional aides that um, also work. They also um, work on their office hours. So if the student needs extra help, you know, they, they'll invite them to their Zoom during those office hours. Okay, that's great. Um, anybody else have any questions? No questions um, from that person. Okay. Can I add to sure. that piece? Um, well, in our district, um, our said department has um, created Google Classrooms to work with the students individually. Um, so sh I have two students who are have an IEP and she does um, contact them every day to go over what um, they need to work on for their IEP. Uh, and so that if she needed to do it virtually, she can do it virtually. If the kids are on paper packet, she's able to call them. It's not the best but she's still able to make contact with them and help them with um, the things that they're missing so that they, they, they can complete their packet. That sounds great. Do you, do you ever have a need to meet um, while social distancing, but meet in person? So you have a, have a mask on, as a student has a mask, you're at least six feet apart. Have you ever had to do that or felt uh -huh. that you had to? I personally haven't, but I know um, we have some students who are being tested for um, to see if they are qualified for um, the special needs program and they do have to sign a waiver and they do have to wear a mask and you know they do do the six feet apart. Um, but that's uh, one kid at a time and I we haven't really discussed that as a district yet. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we're out of time. It's uh, six o'clock. This is a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much for all of your input. I'm sure our audience, the, they didn't have many questions because you answered them all for them through, your, through our discussion. Um, and I asked a lot, obviously. 
Um, I just want to let you know before we go that our next um, session will be on September 16th. Um, that's our Indigenous Perspectives, and it's called The Importance of Voting. So this is that time to think about voting and elect, um, being, um, electing our next leaders. So thank you again and stay tuned. Uh, we have more. I know that um, that Kate has shared our uh, web page and our email address. So if anybody has questions, feel free to email them to us and we'll get your answers to you. So thank you again and have a wonderful evening, everyone.